Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Random Review. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Deborah Goldenberg. Connie Georgiou and I coordinate Random Review for Friends of the Library, which sponsors these events. Connie, there she is. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Connie's saying hello. Thank you. <laughs> and um, also, our uh, library host today is Bonnie Brzezowski, who will be keeping an eye on things and presenting the questions at the end. Uh, Bonnie, could you turn your camera on? There she Hi, is. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks, Bonnie. So um, if you're having any technical problems with GoToWebinar, you can type a question into the question box or the chat box on your control panel, and we'll try and help you out. If your issues can't be resolved, today's program is being recorded, and you'll receive a link to it in your follow-up letter, so you can still watch the review. It will also be available in a more polished YouTube version linked on the library website. Uh, and we encourage you to submit questions for our reviewer at any time during the program using the question or the chat box, and she'll answer as many as we have time for at the end. In your follow-up email, you'll also receive some other links, one of which may be used to access the Random Review webpage, where you can register for future reviews and sign up for our mailing list to receive monthly Random Review information. You can also see a list of books related to today's topic, assembled by our volunteer, Gail Gerdeman. And there will be a link to connect you to the Friends of the Library website, where you can support the Friends by buying a membership or making a donation. We weren't able to hold our big book sale fundraiser this year, so please consider lending your support. I'd like to give a shout out to our local sponsors, Grassroots Books and Music, Northwest Graphic Imaging, and the Corvallis Gazette Times, and especially reporter Jim Day. And a big thank you to the best library and librarians Mike Hansen and Bonnie Brzezowski, who host these webinars and have been instrumental in making the Random Review program possible this year. Next month's review will be on April 14th, when Joey Spadafora, the head of the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology, will review the book, uh, The Tangled Tree, A Radical New History of Life by David Quammen. Now I'd like to invite Stephanie McRae Dickey, co-chair of the Friends of the Library, to introduce today's speaker. And I'll say goodbye for now, as soon as she shows up, and see you at the end. Um, enjoy the review, and there's Stephanie. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's a pleasure to introduce Corinne Gobley, organizational wizard, gourmet cook, cyclist, and master mystery reader and critic. Her recommendations for a new mystery for a new mystery writer for me have given me many hours of reading pleasure. A former junior high English teacher employment counselor, HR specialist, and OSU instructor. Corinne has enjoyed retirement, volunteering for the, uh, the Friends of the Library and the OSU thrift store. She's a much valued member of the Friends board, serving for 20 years in many positions, including co-president and running the big book sale, the fall festival sale and the holiday sale in the early 2000s. Pre-pandemic, she could be found in the book sale room on Fridays, tidying up, sorting no longer desired books, and chatting with browsers. She always has tips for new authors or titles for anyone who asks. Friday afternoons, she tidies up the dis and tidies up and, the dis and displays new merchandise at the thrift shop. Summers, she and her husband trained for their almost yearly tandem bicycle trips to Europe, including a trip through the Dordogne, where she experienced the world and cuisine of Martin Walker's Bruno, another excellent mystery series. Since the pandemic, she's made good use of the, of the e-resources at the library, for her hobby of making sour.
sourdough bread. Should she Hey, Stephanie. So I don't mean to interrupt, but I think we may have lost Stephanie's audio and I'm not sure she can hear us any longer. So what I'm gonna suggest, rather than wait to see if her audio kicks back in and so we don't lose any momentum, let's go ahead and welcome Corey. Um, Stephanie is giving such a lovely interview, so I'm so sorry to interrupt it. But can we get Corey on screen? Beautiful. And then I'm just going to dismiss um, her. Let's see. And we'll get Stephanie off screen here in a second. But I'll go ahead and let you take over. Corey, I'm so sorry that the, um, that the intro got interrupted. But we're so glad to have you here. And you are obviously the most qualified person to be discussing this amazing author. So it's looking forward to getting started with you. At which point I have just lost my um, I have just lost my, okay, here we go. Well, first of all, I want to thank Stephanie for her kind words, and I'd like to thank Deborah and Connie for organizing random review, especially during these very extraordinary times. Also, a special thank you to Andrew Cherbis and Bonnie Brzezowski of the library for their technical expertise and for allowing me to use this space for presentation. And that's why I'm wearing the mask, and I hope that you were able to hear me through it. Today's talk, if I can find my slide, which I can't figure out how to do it anymore because it's changed, it seems. Whoops. You know what I'm going to suggest, Corey, so we can just get this um, going, is why don't I have you stop sharing your screen? I'm going to share mine. I can't figure out how to share it. I'm going to share mine. So let me okay. let me fix that really quick. Um, you can go go ahead. I'm going to share your presentation since you sent it to me. Okay. So I should be able to share it for you. So give me a minute to configure that. If you want to go ahead and talk, that's fine. While I kind of figure this okay. out really quick. Well, the title of today's random review is Louise Penny: A Survey of Her Mystery Novels. That's 16 books. There's it's tremendous overwhelming amount of material within the books as well as about the books. Therefore, what I'm going to try to do is simply highlight those aspects of the book that have kept me engaged over the years, waiting for the next book, and that will hopefully encourage those who have not yet read them to give her a try. So could we go to the next slide? These are the major topics we're going to be talking about today very briefly because there is so much information to cover we'll begin with louise penny on the next slide because so much of her backstory tends to inspire the books that she writes could we have the next slide okay so louise penny was born in 1958 which means she's now 63. she grew up in Toronto, and after college graduation, spent 18 years as a journalist with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. She was stationed in Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, Montreal, and Quebec City, where she covered current affairs, including crime stories, drug wars, biker gangs, and murders. While this experience eventually gave her great material for mysteries, it also led to serious personal problems. The isolation from family and friends, as well as self-loathing and fear that she said resulted from her teenage years led her to alcohol. At one time, she even contemplated suicide. In a New York Times piece, she said, I had developed an unhealthy worldview, which was the world was a scary place filled with people who want to or are capable of doing harm. 
I know what it's like to hate yourself so much that you have to murder yourself. Coming out from that side gave me a profound belief that goodness exists. And remember that term, goodness exists. She came out the other side through Alcoholics Anonymous, beginning her recovery in 1993 at the age of 35 and has been sober since. In 1994, a friend set up a blind date with Dr. Michael Whitehead, a wid widower of 60 who was head of the hematology department at Montreal Children's Hospital. They hit it off. They were married in 1996. And in 1999, they moved to Knowlton, a very tiny village, not on the maps and not available through Wikipedia, that's in the Eastern townships. Does it sound familiar? Her husband once told her, if you want to quit work, I'll support you and you can stay at home and finally write that book that you've wanted to write since you were eight years old. So she did. She decided to write the greatest historical novel ever. And then she spent five years with writer's block, as she said, eating lots of gummy bears, watching Oprah reruns and telling her husband the things were just fine. One day, she looked at the pile of books that she liked to read, Agatha Christie, Dorothy Sayers, Michael Innes. And she decided to write what she liked to read with a structure that she understood. Her first book went through many drafts, including Gamache as a 30-year-old detective, until she finally came up with a man with a main character that she would marry, a place she would want to live that had a bookstore, a bistro, a bakery, a general store, and people she would enjoy as friends. And thus was born Armand Gamache and the little village of Three Pines. Once she finished her book, she tried in vain to find a publisher. She counted at least 50 rejections. So finally, she submitted the book to the British debut dagger competition for first unpublished novels and came in second out of 800 entries. While in London, she found an agent who is still with her today, um, rather by accident while well, she was shopping and they both reached for a blue Pashima scarf. She likes details. She received a contract for three books and her first book, Still Life, was published in 2005. Could you go to the next? Oh, that's, that's never mind. 16 books later, she is popular. Worldwide with sales of 8.5 million copies and the books have now been translated into 31 languages. All the Devils Are Here, published in August of 2020, debuted, debuted as number one on both the New York Times and the Toronto Globe and Mail's hardback fiction bestseller list, making it the best-selling fiction book in North America at that time. It was also listed on many end of the year best mystery lists in 2020, ranging from the Library Journal to the Wall Street Journal. She's well regarded as an author. She's won seven Agatha Awards, as well as the British Dagger, several Anthonys, the McCavity, the Phyllis, and the Canadian Arthur Ellis. She's a former journalist, so she knows the value of PR. She has her own website with monthly newsletters. Her publisher, St. Martin's Press, also maintains a website with reading guides, recipes, trivia questions, and more. Pre-pandemic, she did the book tour circuit and held release parties in Knowlton for her fans. And if that's not enough, there are three Facebook pages, her own, and two for readers, one spoiler-free, and one that does allow you to talk about anything. She's generous with her time. In 2009, she helped to launch a new award for unpublished Canadian mystery writers. And after her husband's death in 2016 of dementia, she established the Three Pines Foundation. And so for the contributions to her, her contributions to Canadian literature and to the community, she's been made a member of both the Order of Canada and the Order of Quebec. And now we can go to the next slide. These are the titles of the book. And one of the most common questions whenever there is a series is, should I read the books in order? And Penny says, well, yes, preferably, but you don't really have to because I'll give the essential details to help you catch up. I think there's a distinct advantage to reading them in order. 
Penny develops both characters and plots often over several books. And what I'm going to look at is Barrier Dead, which was published in 2010 and is one of my favorite books. This book begins with Gamache, our main character, having flashbacks to a stakeout in a factory that went horribly wrong. It left the three main detectives of the series all wounded and several officers dead. This plot line reverberates over several books. One of the most significant outcomes is a rupture between Gamache and his second in command, Jean de Beauvoir. The rupture occurs at the end of the beautiful mystery, book number eight here, and is finally resolved in book number 10, How the Light Gets In. The second plot line in Barrier Dead also derives from that raid. It stems around Gamache's recovery from his physical injuries and his attempt to deal with the knowledge that he made a fatal mistake that led to the injuries and deaths. He's on sabbatical, staying in old Quebec City, doing research at the English Literary and Historical Society. A dead body is found in the basement. He's asked to help. This is the standard murder mystery plot line confined to one book. We find out, we have the murder, we find out who did it and why, and it's over and we don't return to it. But there's a third distinct plot line. And this plot line actually begins in book number five, The Brutal Telling. In The Brutal Telling, a murdered man is found in the bistro of Three Pines, and Olivier Boulet, whose co-owner, becomes the focus of the investigation. In the brutal telling, we learn about his greed and his web of lies, and he pays the price. But in Bury Your Dead, Beauvoir returns to Three Pines, leads a reinvestigation, and identifies the perpetrator. So this is just one book with three plot lines. There are many other plot lines like this that extend over several books. The corruption at the highest levels of the Surete, drug cartels, lost shipments of opioids and fentanyl, and Clara and Peter Moreau's artistic careers and changing relationships. So, in order, I read them when you can get them. It's good to read them in order. And one suggestion I have is whether you read them in order or reread them and you, if you finish the series, pick up still life again, is you will notice so many hints of things to come and be absolutely amazed at Penny's ingenuity in concocting plots and characters. Let's go to the next slide. One of the things that you will find in the books is there are certain overarching or maybe fundamental themes. Penny has stated her book's central message. These books are murder mysteries, but they're not about murder. They're about love and belonging, about loyalty and choices, and the courage to be good. In the real world, violence, betrayal, and cruelty are real things, she says. People rarely choose kindness in crime novels. Chewing it, choosing it shows courage. I want to show goodness and kindness as a legitimate choice. I believe it. So goodness exists has become the linchpin of the books, and it will be repeated in every single book that you read. The inspiration is from Auden's Elegy to Herman Melville. Goodness exists. That was the new knowledge. His terror had to blow itself out to let him see. But how is this manifested? To me, it's in the actions of the characters as they choose to do the right thing, good thing. It's how they work together. It's the villagers of Three Pines who work all night sandbagging to protect the town from the river Bella Bella. It's in still life, Olivier and Gabri reaching out to a young man struggling with his sexuality. Or in the nature of the beast, Ruth, the acerbic old poet, opening her home to a bereaved, betrayed woman, or in Barrier Dead, Gabri steadfastly believing and advocating for his partner, Olivier. Duality is the second major theme. Again, Penny explains what she means by that. As a last word, I feel quite truthfully 
that my books, while clearly and happily mysteries, are really about duality, the gap between what is said, what is felt, the public face and the inner truth. In Penny's books, everyone has secrets, even those who seem to embody goodness. Clara found it easy to forgive most things in people. Too easy, her husband Peter often said, but Clara had her own little secret. She really didn't let go of things. Most things, yes, but some she secretly held and hugged and would visit in moments when she wanted to be comforted by the unkindness of others. Matthew 10, 36, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. This is often the primary or, or found common in most mystery novels, except for those that have to do with random serial colors. Auden is also cited to emphasize this theme. Evil is always unspectacular and always human and shares our bed and eats at our own table. So what Penny has Gamache do is to explore the dark side, the misunderstandings, the rancid emotions, the inability to forgive, the jealousy, the bitterness, the self-hatred and anger that may occur within close relationships that lead to the act of murder. I'm not gonna give a lot of examples here because when every example I came up with ended up being a spoiler and I didn't want to do that if you haven't yet read the novels. Another the fourth theme that Penny doesn't talk a lot about, but I found very specific, is the concept of second chances. She often says she had a second chance when she gave up drinking. Most of our characters in Three Pines, especially Olivier, Gabri, and Myrna, all had second chances at a fulfilling life when they moved to Three Pines. Clara receives a second chance to be recognized for her art, and she and Peter have a second chance to restore their relationship. Annie and Jean Guy both had second chances after failed marriages. Not everyone given a second chance takes the opportunity in the books to do good. Michael Brebeuf, which is Gamache's boyfriend, boyhood friend, colleague, makes choices inconsistent with goodness and pays the price. And that is this, what happens to many of those who are the perpetrators of the crimes in the novel. The final theme or perhaps refrain is quite the opposite of the evil leading to murder. It is joy. And again, it comes from Penny's own experience. It's based by C.S. Lewis's memoir, Surprised by Joy, The Shape of My Early Life. Penny states, I came across it early in my sobriety and that was a magical time because I thought I was going to die by my own hand. I was 35 and I couldn't see going through another year of life, never mind another 40 years. So when I asked for help and got it through a 12 step program, it seemed and perhaps it was a miracle. At that time, I was surprised by joy because I had been so dark and so negative and so afraid. Then to find happiness, and the freedom that comes from not having to drink every day and finding friends and finding myself and finding real joy. You'll find a number of very specific references to Surprised by Joy. In Still Life, Clara has the phrase inscribed on Jane Neal's headstone. Jane, Jean Guy and Annie find joy in the book, How the Light Gets In. In A Long Way Home, Gamache retires every morning to a bench on the brow of the hill overlooking the village with a small tattered book in his hand. The bench is inscribed, surprised by joy. And in real life, in Central Park, across from Michael and Louise's apartment, you can sit on a bench placed by Penny's publisher in honor of Michael after his death with the inscription, surprised by joy. Okay, let's talk about the characters next on the next slide. Novelist describes Penny's books as character driven as she explores the concepts that we talked about previously, goodness and evil, duality, choices, through her characters, their actions and emotions. 
Her main recurring characters are multidimensional, intriguing, frustrating, funny, flawed, sometimes tragic, but always with potential for growth and change, hope and redemption. Penny also portrays characters who lead still lives, observing life from a distance without really fully engaging others. Still others who succumb to jealousy, bitterness, self-hatred and anger, all emotions Penny says she felt during your years as an alcoholic. And these characters are most often the perpetrators of crime, corruption and murder. So let's meet the main characters. Those in green have recurring roles and have generally chosen to be good. Those in gray down on the lower right hand side have gone to the dark side and I won't be describing them today. The central figure, indeed the moral center of all the books is Armand Gamache, named by Bookbub, Bookbub in 2020 as one of the 10 most beloved fictional detectives of all time, along with Hercule Poirot and Sherlock Holmes. The primary inspiration for Gamache was Penny's husband, Michael, but she also credits Atticus Finch in To Kill a Mockingbird and Jean Gamache, a tailor in Granby, Quebec City, who had kind, warm brown eyes. In the beginning of the series, Gamache is a chief inspector with the, of homicide of the Quebec Surete. He's stationed in Montreal. However, through the series, he is promoted, suspended, demoted, retired, and then he returns. He has many second choices. Penny gives us detailed physical descriptions of her character so that we can really create a, a picture in our mind of who they are as they go through the book. Gamache is tall and powerly, powerfully built. In the beginning of the series, he's in his mid fifties. He's not yet going to fat, but he does show that he likes good food, wonderful food. He looks like a professor. His hair, which was once dark and wavy, is now receding and thinning a bit at the top and curling over the collars of his jacket. He tends to be clean shaven. He wears a suit and tie to work all the day. He's always immaculate, even in the heat of the summer. But is what is most striking about him are his eyes, deep, warm, and brown. Through the series, we learn a number of things um, which affect how he addresses life. He lost his parents when he was nine. He speaks British English, having graduated from, Harvard, from Cambridge. He drives a Volvo, makes wild rice stuffing. He does dishes, and he's afraid of heights. He is complex. He's competitive. He's ruthless. And he can make decisions that are viewed as reckless and that can have and do have tragic results. Some of his superiors view him as arrogant and self-righteous, and those views of him constantly test him. I think one of his strengths is the way that he mentors and manages his staff. He looks for potential and has, he offers people second chances. He stresses the importance of asking simple questions to find out the emotions that led to the crime. Tell me what you know. And he reminds them to be humble, to be human, to remember the four statements that Penny actually learned from her husband. I don't know. I was wrong. I'm sorry. I need help. Unlike many contemporary fictional detectives, Gamache has a loving, mostly supportive family. His wife, um, Ren Marie, a professional in her own right, is a librarian at the Bibliothèque Nationale. She's intelligent, warm, the love of his life. She provides stability, common sense, and in the very last book, behind the scenes help. She is serene, classic, and elegant. Their daughter, Annie, daughter Annie, is a large woman, a lawyer, rather awkward and bossy, but a happy woman. Their son, and this is Danielle actually, lives in Paris with his wife and two children. Danielle is estranged from his father, and we learn that in the first book, but we don't learn why until the devils are here in book 16. The second family is his work family. 
these are the specially chosen detectives that he selected, often from dead end positions. Jean Guy Beauvoir was working in the evidence cage because he had alienated all his colleagues and nobody wanted to work with him. When the series opens, he's 35 years old and had been Gamache's second in command for more than a decade. He wore cords and a wool sweater under his leather jacket. A scarf was rakishly and apparently randomly whisked around his neck. It was a look of studied nonchalance, which suited his toned body, but was easily contradicted by the cord tight tension of his stance. Jean Guy was loosely wrapped, but tightly wound. Later, she describes him as a slingshot about to be released. Jean Guy, along with Clara Morrow that you read below, is one of the characters who really evolves the most over the series. In the first books, he's an often judgmental, brash detective who favors facts over emotion. He's also claustrophobic. Now, consistent with Penny's conviction that goodness exists, Jean Guy, who becomes addicted to painkillers, overcomes his addiction and reconciles with Gamache. The second core member of the team is Isabelle Lacoste. We don't have much of a backstory on her yet. She was also given a second chance. She was in the traffic division going nowhere. But on the team, she's the hunter. She's considered to be stealthy, quiet, observant. She is steadier, more mature person than bourgeois. She has a happy home life. And throughout the series, she grows into an accomplished leader under Gamache's mentorship with commensurate increase in duties and responsibilities. Nicole Choquet and Brunel are minor characters, but they all provide a very supporting and crucial role in specific books. Finally, we come to Three Pines and the core residents are the ones that we meet the most. Clara Morrow is the other character who tends to evolve the most and change throughout the series. Penny says, I am for the most part Clara. It's always a joy and a challenge to write her, to look deep inside her in my own security, insecurities, and to reflect. Claire is an artist who in the beginning of the series has not yet found her niche. She creates works that are exuberant, vital, feminist, funny, and sometimes just baffling. She finally, however, receives recognition for, for her insightful portraits of elderly women. Physically, she's described as a food magnet, the Carmen Miranda of baked goods, because whenever she eats, somehow a piece of croissant or muffin ends up in her wild, untamable hair. She wears billowing frocks, Dollarama horn rimmed spectacles. She's good hearted, good friend, and hosts regular potlucks at her home. Her husband, Peter, on the other hand, is always immaculate, classically handsome, tall, broad-shouldered. He looks like a businessman on a closely found adventure. Uh, Penny has made Peter Morrow a prominent artist who supports the two with his exquisite, intricately drawn, inc incredibly close-up compositions of everyday objects, but with his own insecurities which come into play when Clara finally receives recognition. We go to some of the landowners and proprietors in town. Myrna Landers owns the new and used bookstore. She was a psychologist in Monroe, in Montreal, where she felt burned out and left looking for a second chance. And she packed her tiny car with all her worldly positions. And when she rolled into Three Pines, she looked someone who'd, like someone who'd run away from the circus. She's an immense black woman who is given to wearing colorful black and green keftans. She'd gotten lost on the back roads, and when she found the unexpected village, she'd stopped for a coffee, a pastry, a bathroom break, a pit stop on her way somewhere else, somewhere more exciting, more promising, but she never left. Next, we meet Gabri and Olivier, partners who run the Bistro, which is the community gathering center and the bed and breakfast. Olivier is a man in his mid thirties, blonde, trim, well-dressed in a casual way as though he'd walked out of a Land's End catalog. We've heard earlier about the web of lies and his greed, that those aspects that he kept hidden. 
Gabri, on the other hand, is a large exuberant man who wears frilly aprons that say, never trust a skinny cook. Penny contrasts the two men. Unlike Olivier, who was self-contained and fastidious like a cat, Gabri was more like a Saint Bernard, though mostly without the slobber. Finally, there's Ruth. She is a slightly mad, elderly, acerbic poet in her 80s, described as angular, all edges and edgy, with ladders up her stocking and patches on her sweaters and a strong smell of gin or scotch, and with pain that she expresses in poetry. Ruth, like the other characters, is multidimensional. While she's known for her sharp barbs, she also leads the volunteer fire brigade and is the one person to whom Jean Guy opens up about his pain and his plight. Unlike others who keep their private, life, private thoughts hidden, Ruth expresses them. Nothing inside Ruth's head was ever unexposed or unexpressed. It was her heart she kept hidden that came out in her poetry. So these characters sort of come to life in Penny's writing. We care for them. We celebrate when, them when something good happens. We get angry when they do stupid things. And we grieve when tragedy strikes. Now, they all live in Three Pines. And we'll go to Three Pines next on the next slide. As I mentioned, Penny's first novel was rejected at least 50 times. And some of the rejection letters recommended setting the book in the United States, maybe in Vermont, as a Canadian setting just wasn't deemed very marketable. But Penny held fast and said that the books are love letters to a place where she has found a home. And she crafted the first four books in the series explicitly to give the reader a sense of a complete year in Quebec with its changing seasons, sights, scents, and activities. So still life is set a few days before Thanksgiving with autumn leaves, wood smoke, and in deer hunting season. A Fatal Grace, the second book, is winter, and the villagers gather on the frozen lake for the annual curling tournament. Coming from northern Minnesota, I know what curling is. The cruelest month, April, has tulip bulbs beginning to crack the earth and a village green awash with spring flowers and it smells of fresh earth and promise and maybe an earthworm or two. Summer comes in the fourth book, A Rule Against Murder. It's the first time that Penny took us away from Three Pines. It's summer at a posh resort where dark clouds would collect above the mountains at the far end of the lake. A gray curtain of rain would fall in the distance. The wind would pick up, catching and furious, furiously shaking the tall trees. Then it would strike, boom. For Penny, this hamlet, Three Pines, with the village green, the Here's the village green, and then here we have the bistro, the bakery. This tiny hamlet, it's not on any map, it has no satellite connection, is an allegory. It's not a place, it's a state of mind. It's where she lives when she chooses to be kind. She explains, I created the village as a place of community, a place where I would choose to live. It was beautiful and peaceful that offered company and companionship as well as croissants and rich coffee au lait and licorice pipes. That sense of community, the yearning that we all feel, I think that one of the re that's one of the reasons the books are successful across borders and cross cultural groups and ethnic groups and language groups is because as humans, we have certain things in common. And one of the things is, I think we really want to belong. And when you read the Facebook pages, some one of the questions often comes up. If you were going to have coffee at the bistro, who would you want to have coffee with? That sense of community is, I think, what have sold so many books and have made so many ardent fans of Louise Penny. OK, um, let's talk about historical and cultural references next. I'm not going to talk about all of these, but it's amazing. You know, she infuses Canadian history and classical and contemporary cultural references throughout the series, over and above the main arching themes that permeate every book. As mentioned earlier, 
Penny's first failed attempt was a historical novel. I think she's fulfilling that part of that initial desire by making such wide ranging, diverse historical and cultural references. We talked about the basic four themes. However, many books are inspired by another theme. For example, The Cruelest Month, April, was influenced by T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. The Rule Against Murder, the fourth book, was influenced by John Milton and Paradise Lost. The Beautiful Mystery, which takes place as a, at an isolated cloistered monastery, focuses on music, specifically Gregorian chant, chant as well as T.S. Eliot's Murder in the Cathedral. How the Light Gets In, we learn about the Dion quintuplets, The Long Way Home, its um, Canadian art, artists, such as Clarence Gagnon, as well as Conrad's Heart of Darkness and Homer's Odyssey. And The Nature of the Beast introduces us to Gerald Bull, a real Canadian arms designer, who Penny learned about in the mid-90s when she was hosting a current affairs radio program. There are more as you can see some of them here. This is just to whet your interest. And if you were intrigued by this sort of cursory review, I would ask you to look at St. Martin's Press Inspector Gamash series website, because Paul Hochman, one of their employees, writes a cultural, will, will give you information and background about the cultural and historical references. He addresses these major cultural references, such as Gandhi and Goethe and Emerson, but he doesn't write a whole lot about the myriad incidental popular cultural, some of which led me at least to a mild chuckle. In the Kingdom of the Blind, for example, Gamash and Myrna Landers are named executors of an elderly woman's will. She called herself the Baroness, and they are to go out to her deserted, dilapidated home to meet the notary and the third executor. At her deserted house, they meet the third executor, a young man wearing a long red and white striped hat, so long that it tapered to a pom-pommed tail that trailed down his back. Whoever this was, he was as vibrant as their dead host was desiccated. Dr. Seuss meets Charles Dickens, the cat in the hat meets Bleak House. I think that all of these incidental incidents would make a really good book club discussion how many do you find? What are they? As you'll see here, she does the Anne of Green Gables, Captain Kangaroo, The Three Stooges, Laurel and Hardy, Garland and Rooney, musicals, Pete Seeger, and more. Sometimes I wonder if the references, like there's one to Gigi when Gamache and Ren Marie are um, in Paris and they're walking from their apartment in the Marais to the bus and they compare their recollection, the remembrances of their very first walk. And of course, they're not the same. And he says, ah, yes, I remember it well. I think people of my age might remember that reference to Gigi and will know the Garland and Rooney musicals, but I'm not sure they're necessarily that uh, resonant with younger people. Okay, now let's talk about writing style. A co-owner of the Toronto Mystery Bookstore says the key to Penny's success isn't hard to figure out. Good writing is good writing, and Louise is a good writer. Reviewers have called her prose luminous, gorgeously written, and carefully constructed. On the other hand, the blogger, Banff 1972, states that Penny is the best bad writer he knows but then he confesses to having read the entire series. If you are a stickler for every sentence being complete with subject and predicate, or on the other hand, if you prefer fast paced action filled plots with laconic straight talking characters, you might be disappointed in Penny. She writes, as we've seen before, long, languid sentences, often interspersed with short staccato pithy phrases. She takes the time to describe the sights, the sounds, the smells, the sense of what's going around. She describes her um, characters often in, in excruciating detail. Well, I like that attention to detail. 
She has the ability to create vivid images, complete with sounds and smells, and often with an unexpected use of humor. I'm going to read just a few passages that struck me the first time I read them, sometimes because of their humor or because I could relate to the topic. So I grew up in northern Minnesota, and I know what hunting season's like. Still Life, page three. It's hunting season, and Clara is sitting in the bistro. Framed by the mullion, she saw a pickup truck drift down Rue de Molin into the village, a beautiful dappled doe draped languidly over its hood. Every year, the hunters shot cows and horses and family pets and each other. And unbelievably, they sometimes shot themselves, perhaps in a psychotic episode where they mistook themselves for dinner. It was a wise person who knew that some hunters, not all, but some found it challenging to distinguish a pine from a partridge from a person. For really evocative images, I'm going to recommend that you start on page 24 of The Beautiful Mystery. It's a really long passage, so I don't really have time to read it today. But what's happened is that Gamache and Beauvoir have traveled via small plane and open boat to an isolated cloistered monastery. As they walk in and the door thuds behind them, they're faced with light and rainbows. It's an incredibly evocative, um, wonderfully descriptive passage that shows her command of language and imagery. Then as a former English teacher, when I read this passage of The Long Way Home, I thought, what a great assignment for students. And then I thought, what not, how about a great assignment for us now during this pandemic as a reminder of those things we still have. Myrna and Clara have left an unsatisfactory interview with Peter Morrow's brother. And as they walk outside into the blast furnace of the Toronto summer, the heat shimmered off the, pave, off the buildings and bounced off concrete and drilled into the pavement, which gave off the scent of melting asphalt in the heavy, humid air. Myrna found it strangely calming. Her mother's and grandmother's comfort smells were cut grass and fresh baking and the subtle scent of lined dried sheets. For Myrna's generation, the smells that calmed were manufactured. Melting asphalt meant summer. Vapor rub meant winter and being cared for. There were tang and gas fumes and long gone photocopy ink. All, comfort, all comforted her for reasons that beggared understanding because they had nothing to do with understanding. After years in Three Pines, her comfort sense were evolving. She still loved the smell of vapor rub, but now she also appreciated the delicate scent of worms after a rain. She tends, Penny tends to use that um, simile often. There's also sometimes Penny will just use a symbol, single word that just sort of catches you off guard. Here's an example of the use of rule of the use of three, three sentences, three words or phrases to emphasize or to contrast and the unexpected use of a single word. It's again from a long way home. Clara has been watching Gamash every morning. He has, he and Ren Marie have moved to Three Pines. And what he does is he makes his way to a bench that's on the brow of the hill overlooking the valley in Three Pines. She's gathering her courage to sit by him, to speak to him, to ask him a favor. And next morning, as though by magic, a miracle, a curse. She felt the hard maple beneath her bum. Some readers dislike her incessant use of poetry. Penny obviously enjoys it and finds comfort in it. She keeps a tattered copy of the complete works of Auden by her side on the long pine table where she writes her daily 1,000 words. She made Ruth, one of the villagers, a poet. So she has the opportunity to insert poet frequently, but she doesn't write her own poetry. The two primary sources attributed to Ruth are Marilyn Plesner, a self-published Canadian poet who wrote the famous lines that we hear over and over again in the book. Who hurt you once so far beyond repair that you would greet each overture with curling lip? The second primary source is Margaret Atwood, whom Penny 
pays royalties to because, as she said in an interview, in Canada, you're not allowed to piss off Margaret Atwood. But they're not the only poets that she uses. There's also Stevie Smith, Emily Dickinson, T.S. Eliot, Leonard Cohen, Robert Frost, and more. And I think what's interesting is that she also, um, when she was looking to use Leonard Cohen's words, although he had just had some difficult financial difficulty, he refuses to accept any payment. So she is able to use his words for free. I tend to agree with the bookstore owner that Penny's writing is good. I enjoy the contrast between the perfectly crafted complete sentences and the short, sometimes staccato phrases. And I enjoy delving into the details of life of Three Pines, the people, the food, and their lives. And speaking of food, it's probably not a good time, if we could have the next slide, it's probably not a good idea to read Penny when you're with to read Penny when you're hungry, because every book contains quite evocative descriptions of food. Some readers, again, find these descriptions annoying and distracting, but I think during this last year of isolation and social distancing, that's often what we've really missed. So to me, Penny is an underscoring how we build community and develop relationships and friendship by sharing stories, celebrating, and grieving together with food. So I just checked the first 100 pages of Still Life, there are at least 10 significant mentions of food, beginning on page two to three with Clara Morrow and the eventual victim, Jane Neal, who are meeting at the bistro for cafe au lait and croissants. And since the murder took place before Thanksgiving, Penny describes the potluck hosted by Clara and Peter with Gabri and Olivier, Myrna and Ruth and Ben Hadley as guests. They ate by candlelight, the candles of all shapes and sizes flickering around the kitchen. Their plates were piled high with turkey and chestnut stuffing, candied yams and potatoes, peas and gravy. They'd all brought something to eat, except Ben, who didn't cook, but he'd brought bottles of wine, which was even better. It was a regular get together, and potluck was the only way Peter and Clara could afford to hold a dinner party. So here we learn something about Peter and Clara's financial state, and Penny gives, gives us a critical clue for the eventual solving of the murder, which I totally missed the first time through. But it's consistent with her desire to play fair, to provide sufficient clues for the astute reader to solve the puzzle that she has given you. During the initial and subsequent investigations, Gabri and Olivier cater lunch for the Surete officers. It's ham sandwich made with thick sliced ham carved with must have been a maple cured roast with honey mustard sauce and slabs of aged cheddar on a fresh croissant. Armand and Renmarie eat um, breakfast at the cafe with cafe au lait, maple cured bacon, Note the maple. You will read about maple based items, ham, bacon, maple syrup pie, maple glazed salmon, and sometimes the smell of maple in the air. A pan to Canadian food culture. Of course, the characters don't always eat gourmet food. Gamache has a fondness for licorice pipes available through the internet. On a case, Gamache and his crew stop at Tim Hortons to pick up Double Double with brioche, another Canadian tradition. And in A Better Man, when the villagers were sandbagging, um, toiling all night, filling the sandbags, the sandwiches that went first that everyone wanted were peanut butter and honey on Wonder Bread. You can also play a game with the series. Starting with the second book, look for the references to lemon meringue pie. You will find it in every book. It was Michael's favorite. For the last book, All the Devils Are Here, Penny traveled to France to do research. And a friend suggested that she meet Dory Greenspan, the cookbook author who hadn't read Penny's books, but then did read them. And for their meeting, baked a lemon meringue pie for her imaginary friend, Armand Gamache. And now you can find Greenspan's recipe for lemon meringue cookies in honor of Gamache at the New York Times cooking site. In summary, 
I think the food serves to build our appetite, create community, and to showcase Canadian food traditions. And I don't think the descriptions are annoying at all. And if you are looking for real recipes, here is Louise Penny, the Nature of the Feast recipes for um, a fragrant cheese and leek dish with a crunch crumble top, French Canadian pie, maple syrup pie, which you can find at the St. Martin Press website. Could I have the next slide, please? I had originally intended to end with this photo, which is posted on Penny's Facebook page. It's Valentine's Day, and she's joining the local hospital foundation and delivering Valentine's Day treats. To me, it exemplified the generous, joyous person that she has chosen to become. And I could picture Clara, Myrna, Gabri, and even Ruth joining her in this effort. But then, could I have the next slide? Two announcements came out. Two new books. In the 17th in the series, The Madness of Crowd. Um, Gamash is asked to provide security for what appears to be a non-event, a lecture by a statistics professor at a nearby university. Madness takes hold. You'll have to read the book to find out what leads to that. Book number two will be coming out in September from Simon & Schuster. It's a co-author of Thriller, following a novice secretary of state who has joined the administration of her rival. What I think is more interesting necessarily about the books, but how it came to be. Anne Louise was asked that, did I hear that you were friends with Hillary Clinton? Yes, as a matter of fact, strange that should happen. I never thought. Michael was always a longtime fan of Hillary Clinton as I am, but Michael was rabid about her and her politics, and then he died. He had dementia, and he passed away just over a year ago. And Hillary Clinton reads my books, and her best friend who also reads the books follows my Facebook or something and heard about Michael dying. So Hillary wrote me the most beautiful letter of condolence about Michael, which was extraordinary. This was late September of last year, 2016. She's at the end of a vicious election for president of the United States. And she takes time to write a letter about a man she had never met, to a woman she had never met, a Canadian who can't even vote. It was an act of pure, unselfish kindness. And I thought, here is an amazing person. Penny generously invited the Clintons to stay for her for a week at Manoir Hovey, which is the inspiration for the setting of a rule against murder. And if you read the acknowledgments in A Better Man and All the Devils Are Here, you will find a thank you to Hillary and Bill, Chelsea and Mark. So to confirm the Louise Penny fans, you have two books to look forward to this fall. And to those who have not yet visited Three Pines, I hope you visit in the future, especially when you're in need of solace and an escape to a place where there are second chances, you can be surprised by joy and goodness exists. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I love that. And I'm not, I don't actually read Penny. So you've really got me enthusiastic about wanting to. And I love any books that describe food. So I'm, I'm on board with that. And we are, we have time for some questions. I don't have any yet, but this is a really good time to write in any questions. It's just now 1 p.m. We don't get one in like a minute or two. We can go ahead and sign off. I do hear from Stephen. Thank you. Well done. And I agree. I'll give it just a minute. See if anybody else wants to ask a question or provide a comment before we sign off for today. Catherine says, thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. Thank you all for being here. Anybody else? Hmm, let's see. Melissa says, it's rare that Penny refers to people who have died, such as Jane Neal, but we don't hear about other ones or moves into their houses. Interesting. Any thoughts on that? Oh, well, and Diane has a question. How much longer might she keep writing? Do you have any thoughts on how much longer she might keep up the series? 63. 
<laughs> I think she's got a few more years left. Nice. Mariana says, excellent review. Thank you. And then Chris asks, what is it about mysteries do you think that is so attractive as a genre? I remember um, P.D. James interviewed a long time ago for Masterpiece Mystery. And she said, those people who are attracted to mysteries, number one, tend to like puzzles because they are puzzles. But she said the other thing they also, that what she hears and what she thinks is that they like the sense of closure. There's a lot of literature that ends very ambivalently and justice doesn't always prevail. And mostly in, his, in mysteries, justice prevails. So you get a sense of, you get a puzzle, you get a sense of closure and you get justice. At least that's, that's what I read them for. As well as for me, I really like international stories. As Stephanie said, the Dordogne, every time I read Martin Walker, I can just picture the landscape there. So it can bring you to different places, introduce you to people and characters that you don't know anything about. And Patty asks, what exactly are licorice pipes? Ah, you can look at them on Google. They actually look like a tiny little pipe. And I, I, I don't think they're quite as strong as some of our black licorice, but you can order them online. You can also go to the Brome Lake um, bookstore, which has a special Louise Penny corner, and you can order I'm Fine t-shirts and gamache mugs and three pine, and you can take a tour in Quebec of the sites of Barrier Dead. And you can also take a tour of the Eastern Township of all the places that inspired Terry, um, Penny. It's really, I think she's added to the economic base of that area of Canada. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, we'll do one more question and then um, we'll invite everybody to come on and say goodbye. Um, Kathleen asks, how much French language is present in the books? That's a good question. There's not a lot. There's not that much. What is interesting is she throws in a lot of French swear words so you can enhance your vocabulary that way. And if you go to her website, she has some French pronunciation guides, which is helpful, especially for the names of the characters. Nice. That's helpful. And um, let's do one more because Diana asked a good question, and this is a good one to finish off with. Are there other mystery writers that you would recommend? Ah, this is the question that comes up on the Facebook page all the time. Um, one is Anne Cleves, who is a personal friend of Penny. They met together. Deborah Crombie, Ellie Griffiths, um, Martin Walker again. I would go to the um, website for Louise, the Three Pines Mystery Club or whatever it is, book club. And they discuss that and you get many, many lists. And then also on your library um, website, you also with through Novelist, right? You can find recommendations of similar. If you like this author, you may also like. You can, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. If you, any title in the library's catalog, if you actually click on the title, there's usually a series and recommendations little link and so that novelist content is all fed in and that's all from librarians and librarians actually create and maintain and staff novelists and so it's a really cool resource that's um, by librarians and for readers so check it out and ask the library if you want to know how to check it out we're happy to show you and um, let's invite you. everybody oh, go ahead. one thing i'll also say is that there i know that from working in the book sale room that people don't like gore her mysteries are not gory. They're they're often they often take. Um, you don't hear them. I mean, it, it's they're 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 almost cozies. They're cozies with a little bit of police procedural. Gotcha. That's good to know. Yeah, that's such an important distinction. So thanks for thanks for clarifying. Um, I wanted to invite Deborah, Connie, and Stephanie back on, um, just so we can say goodbye. I'll stop sharing my screen here. If you guys are able to come back on, it's most of us at least. We don't have Stephanie, but that's probably good enough for us to say goodbye. Yeah, I want to say, 
I want to say thank you to our audience and especially to Corrine, who gave a wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you all for your patience at the beginning when we had some audio difficulties. You sat through it and I think they were resolved for most people. So thank you for coming. We hope you join us next time and um, have, a, have a great month. See you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.